Welcome. This is 49 F9 and we're going to apply Gauss's law to find the electric field near a line of charge. So this is a very different geometry than what we've been dealing with. And here's a diagram showing the geometry. Uh, we have a line of charge in the middle. We're going to say an infinite line of charge so that we don't have to worry about the ends. And then our point of interest is somewhere on the side, and I showed it here. It's just this point here. Now, remember, um, you're given the problem and you're not told the Gaussian surface. So you've got to think, why is it that they used a spherical Gaussian, a, a cylindrical Gaussian surface this time and not a uh, spherical Gaussian surface. And you can see, well, it's, it's a line of charge. It's not a point of charge or a ball of charge or a shell, a, a cylindrical shell of charge. It is a line of charge. And so that uh, a spherical symmetry will not work. So what symmetry does work, and what they did here was, the, the trick is you, you look at the electric field. And if that's my line of charge looking down from above, then the electric field, say it's positive charge, the electric field will, will move out radially. So that lends itself to something to do with circles. But then if I look at the line of charge from the side, it's a bit, bit wobbly, I'm sorry, on any level, because it's infinitely long, there's no end effects, on any level, the charge will be on a plane like a disc, like a compact disc. And so I put those guys together and I realize, oh, that kind of makes a pattern which lends itself to a, a cylinder. Now, let's think about our rationale for what makes a good Gaussian surface and what makes a poor Gaussian surface. And one thing is, if the area vector is perpendicular is parallel to the electric field vector and can you see on these on the outside of the cylinder that's the case both the area vector and the electric field vector will be radial should really draw them like that shouldn't i so there's my electric there's my area vector and it's parallel to my electric field vector um now what about these top and bottom slices well there's my electric field vector and here's my area vector and can you see they're at 90 degrees to each other? The same goes for this bottom surface. There's my electric field vector, and here's my area vector at 90 degrees. And remember how we said, either make the electric field and the area vector parallel, or make the electric field and the area vector perpendicular. Okay, so we get a, a bit of an unusual uh, Gaussian surface, and actually the equation we get out of it is also a little bit unusual. We have 2ke lambda. What is lambda? Lambda equals the charge per unit length. It's the, it's the linear charge density for this, for this line of charge over r. And r is the distance from the structure of the charge to the point of interest. So where does this come from? Let's, let's show this. So, first thing we do is we visualize. So let's draw ourselves the line of charge and then we take our point of interest. And then we say, okay, I want my, I want my um, Gaussian surface to be on that point of interest and it's going to be a cylinder. And I can divide the cylinder up into three bits. There's the top bit, the bottom bit, and then there's the edge bit, the side bit, the, the sleeve, if you like. And I know for my point of interest, the electric field and the area vector are parallel. And I know for this top surface, the electric field and my area vector are perpendicular. And I know for my bottom surface, the electric field and the area vector is perpendicular. So I need to work out what's going on. And what I say is that, of course, my flux is equal to the integral of V dotted with dA 
which equals the Q inside the Gaussian surface over epsilon naught. And I know for surface 1 and 3, my electric field is perpendicular to my dA. So E dA cosine 90, of course. Cosine 90 equals 0. That equals 0. So there's no flux going through 1 or 3. So then I say for 2, so everything now is going to be for 2. For 2, I know that E is parallel to dA. And so I say, oh, in that case, I can say that my flux is equal to the integral of the magnitude of E times the magnitude of dA times the cosine of zero degrees, which does not equal zero, equals Q inside over epsilon naught. And then I say, oh, well, then the next thing I realize is E is constant on this Gaussian surface, on this section of the Gaussian surface, because all the points are the same distance away from the charge. So then that gives me that my flux is equal to E times the integral of dA, which equals Qn over epsilon naught. And then I say, oh, well, of course, I know what the integral of dA is. My integral of dA is, and can you say it? Can you write it down? Try it. Write it down. See what you think. And the answer is 2 pi r times l. Whoa, where did that come from? Well, it's 2 pi r because that's the circumference of the sleeve and it's times L because that's the height. We basically took the sleeve and we unrolled it and it's L and that's 2 pi R. Okay well that was different so we say flux is equal to E times 2 pi R L, which equals Q inside over epsilon naught. And then we're going to do our rearrangement. So we say, OK, E is equal to Q inside over 2 pi R times L epsilon naught. Now at this stage we usually do something with uh, Ke. Ke is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. Ooh, we only have 2 pi epsilon naught. Oh, well, that's okay. 2 Ke is equal to 1 over 2 pi epsilon naught. Still works. So I can say that E is equal to Q inside 2Ke over, let's get this right, so that cancels with that and that cancels with that, over RL. Mmm, okay. What's the Q that's inside? Well, seems to me the Q that's inside will be my linear charge density times L these guys together. If I chose to draw a bigger uh, uh, cylinder, I'd have a bigger L, which means that I'd have more charge, but I'd also have bigger L in here. So it would work out. So this is going to equal uh, Q. Oh, I, I need to write that down. So I say, oh, lambda is equal to Q over L. So Q inside is going to equal lambda times L. So I come along, I'm running out of space, aren't I? But I'll squeeze it in. E is equal to 
lambda L 2KE over RL, which equals, let's see if I can get this sorted out, 2KE lambda over R. And if I have numbers, then it's going to be 2 K E leave K E alone lambda. It says six coulombs per meter. So that's going to be six over R, the distance from the structure to the point of interest. And it says two meters from an infinitely long wire. So that's going to be two. So this would equal six K E newtons per coulomb meter squared there's my there's my answer so it's interesting it's it's using the same principles as we used in the previous gauss's law problems but because the geometry is different so the the preferred gauss's law um uh, gaussian surface is is different in truth the people who originally did this work were really insightful and and uh, um, had good visualization and good analytical skills. We come along afterwards, and there's a finite number of examples and structures that we typically look at. And so, for us, it's more a case of understanding what they did rather than inventing what they did as if we'd never seen it. So it's not quite the same skill set. Um, but it's still a good a good skill to have and practice. It's really is quite useful. So there we have it.